One district in China's capital has been officially declared high risk for the virus, but many believe it's not the only one. An internal CDC document from China obtained by NTD reveals the regime's early efforts to cover up the outbreak. More areas in China are facing closures. Video show the situation in China's northernmost province worsening. Provincial authorities in northern China say they will punish officials for failing to contain a new outbreak of the CCP virus there. And the pandemic is pushing countries to rethink their relationship with China. Today, we begin reviewing the U.S.-China relationship, starting with the role of Wall Street. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Chaoyang District in Beijing has been officially classified as high risk. It's the only area in China with a classification. Even cities like Wuhan, Harbin, and Guangzhou, whose virus situations have been talked about a lot on Chinese social media recently, don't have it. Community spread during the last 14 days is one criteria for high risk. That means the virus needs to be spreading within the community, not just coming from outside. According to Chinese state media, an imported case was confirmed in Chaoyang District in Beijing on April 14th, and this person infected three other people. Evidence shows China has been underreporting its figures since the outbreak began, and it's very likely other places in China are experiencing community spread. It's just that the media is forbidden to report on it without permission from authorities. The latest evidence of a Chinese cover-up is an internal CDC document we just received. It shows that five days before authorities admitted there was human-to-human transmission, the Chinese CDC held an online training for provincial-level branches on how to treat novel coronavirus. The document from China's Inner Mongolia says the training was held on January 15th. Two days later, the Inner Mongolia CDC held online training for its local branches on the same topic. It wasn't until three days later, on January 20th, that authorities announced human-to-human transmission. Some provinces have now set dates for China's two most important political meetings. They were originally postponed from February to March. But the form will change this year, and the attendees will meet remotely. Netizens have said they are using three ways to tell if the epidemic is actually under control in China. The first is when the two main political meetings are held. The second is when the schools are reopened. And third is when the border with Russia and North Korea is reopened. Only half the criteria has been met so far. Some of the schools have reopened. China's foreign ministry spokesperson Hua Chongyi wrote on April 9th, You are welcome to China any time to talk to anyone in the streets and enjoy the freedom. But when a reporter from the New York Times tried to do just that, he had plainclothes police follow him around Hefei City. The reporter Paul Moser published an article about his experience on April 17th. Located in central China, Hefei is a middle-class area, a place of uplifting stories post-virus, or so Moser thought. But every time he tried interviewing a local, police showed up to stop it. That was his last trip in China. He's part of a group of journalists expelled by China on March 18th. A reporter from the Australian Financial Review tweeted on April 16th that an internal hospital memo from Wuhan banned staff from talking to foreign media, as well as posting on social media. The hospital received an influx of inquiries from foreign media after the lockdown was lifted on April 8th. The notice added any interview requests must be cleared by the regime's party office first. Germany's largest paper, Bild, issued an open letter to Chinese leader Xi Jinping on April 16th, saying he's endangering the world. He wrote that the Chinese regime and scientists had to know long ago that coronavirus is highly infectious, but left the world in the dark about it. Your top top experts didn't respond when Western researchers asked to know what was going on in Wuhan. He also mentioned the laboratories in Wuhan and asked why the toxic laboratories are not as secure as China's prisons for political prisoners. He said he rules by surveillance, adding surveillance is a denial of freedom. And a nation that is not free is not creative. And that is why China is the world champion in intellectual property theft. China enriches itself with the inventions of others instead of inventing on its own. The reason China does not innovate and invent is that you don't let 
the young people in your country think freely. This open letter comes after an article from a day earlier titled What China Owes Us, which called for Beijing to pay Germany nearly $165 billion in damages caused by the pandemic. That same day, the Chinese embassy in Berlin responded, refuting the claims. Bild also created a three-minute-long video version listing all the things she and the party did wrong, even adding simplified Chinese characters for Asians to follow along. India has upped its scrutiny of foreign investments on Saturday. Under the new FDI guidelines, countries that share a border with India now need government approval to invest. While it did not mention China specifically, Chinese firms are the first to be affected. One expert saying it appears that the government feels that if China's money pumping goes unchecked, it could have drastic impact on ownership of assets in the country. India is not the first one to move in this direction. German media reporting a new draft bill which would revise the current FDI rules. The revision will give the German government more scope to intervene in any foreign investment coming from outside the European Union. Right now, it can only intervene if the transaction poses a threat to public security. Under the new rules, it can intervene if it's likely to pose a threat. No country is mentioned in the draft, but many experts believe it's aimed at China. Australia's foreign minister is calling for an independent investigation into the coronavirus. She says she's highly concerned about China's transparency. The Australian Home Affairs Minister Peter Dutton told China to provide clarity around the origins of the CCP virus last Friday. He says the families of over 60 Australians who have died from the disease deserve it. Two former Canadian ambassadors to China are urging the Canadian government to face the truth about the pandemic. David Mulroney said Ottawa's almost humiliating posture toward China in recent weeks was a missed opportunity to acknowledge the country's shortcomings during the outbreak. Guy St. Jacques said leaders in Canada and elsewhere need to call for a full investigation of the WHO because it uncritically repeated inaccurate information from Beijing. Adding, I'm not suggesting that we need to insult China or provoke a quarrel. We should simply be guided by the facts. And right now, the facts argue for the case that China was delinquent, that it wasn't transparent enough. Recent videos circulating online show some areas in China's northernmost province are facing closures again. NTD Xu Wenrong has more. A video posted online on April 19th shows the situation in Harbin City. The person taking the video says the area she's in is being locked down again. She adds, now that the iron railings have been put up, community workers have also been dispatched. It's more serious this time. An April 16th video shows a person in the same city saying another area is now completely locked down. A local resident told us that the situation seems worse than the first outbreak. Looking at the whole picture, many communities in Harbin City, such as Hepeng community, have been locked down. There's basically 24-hour surveillance at the gate. The level of alertness and tension are much higher than the first period of the outbreak. He says the situation in Chichihar, the second largest city in Heilongjiang province, is worse than officials admit. Now all Harbin nursing homes are closed down. No one is allowed to enter or exit. There were many cases in Chichihar city a while ago. But the government covered it up. Local people can verify this. It's also the case in Harbin. It's just they don't tell you. An April 11th video shows a line of people from the front of a Harbin hospital all the way to the street. Many closure notices have been circulating since then. Netizens and residents suspect the epidemic is getting out of control there. The government blamed the current situation on imported cases. Mr. Yu says the situation was already severe even before there were any imported cases. In fact, no one knows how many are infected. The government and the news media are all silent. Before there were any imported cases, Chichihar city was already in a very serious situation.
What they said about zero infections, zero new cases, zero deaths is all false. No one believes it. Mr. Yu says the government's downplaying means people aren't taking the necessary precautions. An April 19th video shows what's said to be an infected person on a Harbin bus. The woman in the video says everyone on the bus will need to quarantine. A recent video shows a park in Harbin city packed with people. Netizens said a big group of police then arrived to disperse the crowd. Reporting by Chang Chun and Shu Wenrong, NTD News. There are reports of medical workers and officials contracting the CCP virus in northern China. It seems new clusters of the virus began appearing after lockdown measures were lifted. In the northern Chinese city of Harbin, provincial authorities said Friday they would punish officials for failing to contain a new outbreak of the CCP virus. The same day, in another northern region, a new case of the virus was reported. Authorities in Liaoning province said the person was infected while they were treated at a hospital in Harbin. The announcement said the 18 individuals failed to fulfill responsibilities related to the virus. It added that new virus cases had emerged since April 9th in Harbin, with some contracting the infection at a hospital. The officials to be punished work in health-related agencies and three local hospitals, including Harbin Chest Hospital. One of the officials had only been in her post for two days. She had been newly appointed to replace the director of the Harbin Health Commission on April 15th. State-run media reports from the same day said six medical staff from among the three hospitals had contracted the virus. But reporting and investigation by NTD sister company The Epoch Times has shown regional authorities in China routinely under-report their virus data. Local residents in Harbin spoke of clusters of the virus breaking out as people started having dinner parties again. One hospital leader added that 500 people went into quarantine following contact with recently diagnosed virus patients but thousands more could be infected. After lockdown measures were eased in Harbin last month, the city again went under partial lockdown early April. The pandemic is forcing countries around the world to rethink their relationships with China. The U.S. is no exception. As of Monday, the United States had reported more than 760,000 infection cases, more than any country in the world outside of China. In New York, the country's epicenter, hospitals are overwhelmed and businesses have shut down. The usually bustling Times Square remains empty. What is New York's role in the U.S.-China relationship? Today, we'll start with one case from Wall Street. Imagine retiring after a long career serving in uniform, only to learn that your savings all those years had helped fund advanced weapons systems for America's adversaries. In an op-ed published by the Wall Street Journal last year, former Navy Secretary Richard Spencer described such a scenario. He was talking about the Thrift Savings Plan, or TSP, a pension fund for U.S. lawmakers, White House staff, and military members. The board overseeing the fund had decided to put these servicemen's retirement savings into an index. The index was developed by New York-based company MSCI, the world's biggest stock index compiler. The index includes the following Chinese companies. AviChina, an arm of AVIC, which develops equipment and weapons for the Chinese Air Force. Its subsidiary was sanctioned by the U.S. government for helping Iran develop missiles. Hangzhou Hikvision, a state-owned Chinese company that sells surveillance cameras to detainment camps in Xinjiang, where the regime detains millions of Uyghur Muslims. ZTE, a telecom giant that sells products to Iran and North Korea in violation to U.S. sanctions. It's been accused of posing a risk to U.S. national security. And Tencent, owner of Chinese social media app WeChat. The app has been accused of helping the Chinese regime monitor dissidents and silence whistleblowers, especially during this pandemic. A U.S.-based nonprofit is suing WeChat for stifling key information about the outbreak, leaving the world in the dark and unprepared. The nonprofit said thousands of people have joined the lawsuit. Those are the companies taking the retirement savings from 5 million U.S. federal workers. Senators Marco Rubio and Jean Shaheen have introduced a bill to block the TSP from allowing it. The House has also introduced a similar bill. And the index is one of many developed by MSCI. 
Last November, the company increased the weighing of China A stock market shares from 5% to 20% in some of their indexes. This could lead to over $80 billion in fresh investment into China's economy. Others quickly followed suit. FTSE Russell, the world's second largest index company, announced in February that it would increase the weighing for Chinese stocks. Bloomberg also did something similar. The Wall Street Journal reported that the MSCI's decision came under heavy pressure from the Chinese government, which tried to curtail the company's business in the country. The report said the regime's influence has put the independence of the index giant into question. In the UK, criticism grows over the Chinese state's handling of the pandemic. Several prominent conservative politicians are pushing for a rethink of the UK's relationship with the CCP. NTD's Jane Wirrell reports from London. Standing in for Boris Johnson, the UK foreign minister on Thursday night, saying there will be hard questions for China. In relation to China, look, I think there absolutely needs to be a very, very deep dive uh, after the event review of the lessons, uh, including of the outbreak of the virus, and I don't think we can flinch from that at all. In 2015, former Finance Minister George Osborne, under the Conservative Prime Minister David Cameron, declared a so-called golden era between the UK and China. The pandemic has cast a stark new light on such ties. A growing chorus of British politicians are voicing their concerns over the UK's relationship with the Chinese Communist state. So I think all this is going to very much change the image of China with many members of parliament and there will absolutely be a rethink on our relationship. The UK's decision to allow Huawei a role in its 5G network earlier this year sparked concern from the US, its allies and politicians from within Johnson's Conservative Party. Huawei's links with the Chinese Communist Party are well documented. The UK government has said that Huawei is a high-risk vendor and also allowed them a role in the 5G network capped at 35%. I think the government's been misadvised. I hope that events of recent weeks will have really woken them up to the danger of being beholden on a company which is so closely run by the Chinese uh, Communist government. Lord William Hague, former UK Foreign Minister, warned at a webinar on Wednesday that the UK can't be reliant on technology from China because the country doesn't play by our rules. And I think the mood in, in, in this country vis-à-vis -vis China, or perhaps one should say vis-à-vis -vis the, the Chinese Communist Party, because one shouldn't really conflate necessarily the two, uh, is definitely um, less forgiving than it was. China needs the rest of the world as much as the rest of the world needs China. Um, so I think that uh, we, we need to look at that Huawei decision again. US lawmakers have slammed the UK's decision about Huawei, with Washington repeatedly warning London about Huawei's security risks. A number 10 spokesperson said the UK government's position on Huawei hasn't changed. Jane Wirrell, NTD News, London. And 40% of the British public oppose allowing Huawei into the UK's 5G network. That's according to a new poll, which also found the majority of Brits want China to face an international investigation over the CCP virus outbreak. Our UK correspondent Jane Wirrell has the details. A new poll has found more than 80% of the British public think Boris Johnson's government should call for an international investigation into the Chinese regime's response to the outbreak. And if evidence emerged that the Chinese state breached international law in its initial handling of the crisis, 71% think the CCP should be sued. That's according to a poll commissioned by foreign policy think tank Henry Jackson Society. It published a report this month saying the Chinese Communist Party could be liable to compensate the world's top seven economies at least $4 trillion. As politicians within Boris Johnson's Conservative Party voice their concerns about Chinese telecom giant Huawei, there appears to be less trust from the British public too. The survey found that 40% oppose allowing Huawei a role in the UK's 5G network, while 27% are in favour. The survey that's polled about 1,000 people last week also found that 74% thought the Chinese state was to blame for allowing the CCP virus to spread. Two U.S. senators today proposed a $500 billion rescue package for local governments. The funding is designed to help at the state and municipal levels, which will likely not receive funding from the next virus relief bill. 
Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy, a Republican, and New Jersey's Democrat Bob Menendez represent two of the states hit hardest by the pandemic. They say the funds would be allocated based on states' populations, infection rates, and revenue losses in order to ensure the money goes where it's most needed. This as governors and local officials across the U.S. have been pleading for more federal aid. They say it's needed to provide essential services while Americans stay home and businesses remain shuttered. Over 750,000 Americans have tested positive for the virus. More than 70,000 have recovered and more than 40,000 have died. And while New York's situation is improving, Massachusetts cases are increasing. The state now has the third most cases in the nation. NDD's Melina Weiskup has the updates. U.S. hospitals with unused space now have the green light to start offering elective surgeries and procedures. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced the change Sunday, adding that nursing homes are now required to report CCP virus cases to patients, their families, and the CDC. New York has seen progressively fewer deaths in recent days, with Sunday being the first time that fewer than 500 people died in one day. The state's rate of hospitalizations is dropping, and it's ramping up testing. We're starting the largest antibody test ever done today. The president on Sunday expressed gratitude toward the nation's governors, with special thanks to New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, showing a video of his remarks. I want to thank uh, Governor Cuomo, the relationship there for this whole thing. We're, we're building up. You'll turn out the lights and we'll see if we can do that. Thank you. Do I have faith in the president? Look, what the federal government did working with states, as I just said, was a phenomenal accomplishment. As New York shows signs of the outbreak easing up, attention turns to Massachusetts, which is seeing an increase in cases. Governor Cuomo said he's prepared to send 400 ventilators to Massachusetts. Right now, Massachusetts is going through the surge. The state seeing over 1,100 more confirmed cases and double the amount of people passing away in just one week. The coronavirus response coordinator said the federal government is focusing on Massachusetts, Chicago, and Ohio, which has seen the most recent outbreak. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. U.S., Mexico, and Canada have agreed to extend their travel restrictions across all their borders. As of now, restrictions are set to end on May 20th. And in New York, over 4,300 members of the NYPD have tested positive for the virus. But thousands have recovered and are returning to their post. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on the force. Over 4,300 people have tested positive for the virus in the largest police force in America. But there's a silver lining. As of Sunday, over 2,200 have recovered and returned to their posts. NYPD Sergeant Joseph Imperatrice said he almost finds that number hard to believe. It's incredible because you see all around the world and especially in the city, these officers that have been seriously ill, some of them have gone to the hospital, some of them have lost loved ones. And to have these officers back on the front line to do their jobs and to know that they're healthy once again, that's the most important thing. But dozens of New York's finest have fallen to the CCP virus. Another two members of the NYPD died this weekend, a total of 29 dead since the first death on March 27th. That's including civilian and uniform members. The sergeant, who's also the founder of Blue Lives Matter NYC, said he's thinking of having a fundraiser for their families to cover funeral costs or anything else they might need. Hopefully going forward, when all this ends up stopping and becomes safe again, it would be great if... Blue Lives Matter NYC had the opportunity of possibly throwing one big bash outside for all the families. Um, Everyone could come and support them and possibly raise a ton of money, which would be divvied up to each of the families. To help reduce the number of new positive cases in the NYPD and other agencies, Imperatrice said people should continue being more considerate of hygiene and distance. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. The National Institute of Health is partnering with 16 drug companies. The goal is to speed up the process of making vaccine treatments for the CCP virus. Federal researchers and 16 pharmaceutical companies will work together to standardize methods and models that scientists are using to test COVID-19 compounds. The newly established public-private partnership will also give researchers access to high-level lab facilities. The Institute's director said now is the time to come together. 
Walmart is bringing on 50,000 new workers to help the company cope with increased demand. The move comes on the heels of a previous hiring surge of 150,000 new employees. Walmart is the nation's largest grocer, and it's one of the few big box retailers that's staying open during the pandemic. With people stuck at home, sales of household staples are up significantly. And now Walmart says it needs more temporary and part-time workers to meet the demand. The Walt Disney Company will soon furlough almost half of its workforce, but the over 100,000 employees can still get full health benefits. This week, Disney will start to furlough more than 100,000 employees. The action comes in response to the CCP virus outbreak. The pandemic has shut down or disrupted the company's media and theme park businesses. Disney said last week that it would start with non-essential U.S. employees. All impacted workers will remain Disney employees through the furlough period and receive full health care benefits. The company didn't say how many employees would be affected. Disney's Shanghai Resort resumed some operations in March, although the main theme park remains shuttered. Some activities reopened in Disney Town, wishing Star Park and Shanghai Disneyland Hotel with limited capacity and reduced hours. All guests are required to wear a mask and have their temperature taken on arrival. While social distancing is bad news for business, it does present more chances to wander through serene streets. Our France correspondent David Vives took to the Parisian neighborhood of Montmartre to try it out. Lockdown in the French capital has lasted for over a month. No lanes of traffic, no bars pumping out music. The air has never seemed so clear. Spring returned to a calm city, where there looks to be more birds than humans in the streets. Montmartre is a place where the heart of Paris beats. Usually, this place is crowded with tourists. Residents enjoy the clear view over the capital. It's like visiting monuments from a faraway place. I have lived here for about 25 years. That's a lot. But I don't come to the Basilic that often. It's very sunny. It's not always the case in Paris. Montmartre looks like a little village in a big city. It's also a neighborhood where bohemian-style painters and musicians gather to create their art. And it's surprising to find out how its residents feel about defending it. Like Eric Zero, who manages the vineyard a hundred yards away from the Montmartre Basilic. In 1993, Montmartre mayor wanted to have buildings here. But all of the residents opposed him and chose to plant a wine yard instead. This will be forever preserved and protected. The early work on the vineyard was already done this year before the lockdown, and gardeners planted flowers. But Soro still hopes the lockdown will end soon. The most important work is in June, July, August. So we really need to be there. This is when we do budding and other treatments. At the end of the day, the streets start to be filled with people wandering. Empty streets are pleasant, but not good news for the economy. According to French President Emmanuel Macron, the lockdown in France will end on May 11th. David Vives, NTD News. And for the first time since the pandemic broke out, Italy saw a decrease in active cases. In Italy, the number of deaths is still on the rise, but much slower than before. The good news is that for the first time since the start of the outbreak, Italy's number of active cases fell from the day before. Now it's around 108,000. According to Italy's regional health observatory, it would take until the end of June for the daily number of cases to reach zero. In Parisian suburbs, an area with fragile social peace, police and civilians clashed on Sunday. Tensions are on the rise due to the imposed lockdown. Social media videos show fireworks aimed in the direction of officers while police responded with tear gas. In Russia, thousands of troops have been ordered into a two-week quarantine. Before the order, they had been rehearsing for the annual Red Square military parade, which has been postponed. Russian media reports suggest the virus spread among those who took part in rehearsals. And in Denmark, barbershops are reopening after a month-long lockdown. Across Europe, people are desperate for haircuts, some hoping to fix homemade missteps. In Greece, One-third of people asked to put it at the top of their priority list when the health crisis ends. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates and see you tomorrow.